It's uh, 7 o'clock or 7.01. Um, that means it is time for Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. So live from Pahrump, the Valley of the Dirt People, as far as I'm concerned, and that's a compliment. This is uh, Tech Talk Taco Tuesday number 28. That means we've been doing it for half a year, as Mitch liked to remind me. And uh, that's a long time. Uh, this started out as um, me showing up at Ramiro's Mexican restaurant with my iPhone and uh, pointing it backwards at myself and saying, guess what? We're doing a podcast. So how does it feel to be on your first Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, Logan? Pretty good. Pretty good. So Logan, why don't you tell everybody about yourself? Because they're probably wondering why there's some kids sitting next to me when all Jimmy does is sit around and drink beer and talk about dirt bikes. That's that's a question for you? Yeah. Or, you know, make a statement? So I <laughs> ride at 85 Yamaha. Yep. And a YZ250F 2019. Okay. Is that all they need to know? Uh, yeah. Thanks. So you can also tell them you helped me at my riding schools? Yeah. And you, what's your main job there? Uh, to pick up bikes. <laughs> Which is true. Well, that's how you started, but now you're getting to the point where you're actually teaching guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Logan is a young little ripper out here. Um, uh, he's actually, is kind of surprised when he showed up with a YZ250 uh, the last time I saw him, because uh, he was, he was, he was... He had no problem riding around on the, we have a, a lower DRZ, no problem on that thing. Then we started putting him on the KTM 200. We just put a lowered seat on it, no problem. And how tall are you? Uh, like 5'3". Five, 5'3", three. Five, three. yeah. He needs to be on an 80 for a little bit longer. But dad don't care. Dad's like, get him on the 250, right? <laughs> so I'm going to adjust this camera over here. So tonight um, on our show, um, if anything goes wrong with the show, you can blame Logan. Um, cause he's the only thing that's different about this show or any of those other shows that were absolutely perfect before this. Uh, I like to say that what this show is about is we talk about dirt bike and dirt bike related products. Um, my name is Jimmy Lewis. Uh, I am the, um, oh, what do I do anymore? I'm the helicopter pilot at dirtbiketest.com. It's a website. Uh, if you're really, if your fingers are not too busy, you can go and type in that and you can see all kinds of cool content and information up there been testing motorcycles since I was a little bit younger than probably Logan. Uh, I did it professionally for a good portion of my life, and now I do it as a charity service to anybody that would like to listen to what we have to say. So um, what we do is we usually put up a couple posts on Facebook. We pull down some of the questions on our YouTube feed, and we uh, put those questions down here. I answered them, and then we answer the stuff that you guys ask live on the uh, Facebook, Facebooks, as I like to call them, uh, which I'm going to go there now and see who's who's there and what's going on. It should tell me that somebody is live, but this is where you have to start. You have to start telling everybody something interesting. Uh, tell everybody you don't ever watch this podcast because your dad won't let you go on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a Facebook page? Yeah. You have an Instagram account? Yeah. Holy Molly, what, well, tell everybody what your Instagram is so they can go follow you. You're going to get at least 10 new followers right now. Uh, I think it's... You think? I don't know what it is. You're going to you're gonna have to... Okay, you're going to have to get like a thing, like a shirt. See, you remember how when we were... Okay, and, and this is another thing that Logan did. So a couple of the uh, previous episodes of Tech Talk, Logan put those up on... Um, he actually edited the videos and, and put them up on YouTube for me because these kids are pretty amazing. Even though he can't talk or is like he, the cat's got his tongue, as we like to say, he's pretty proficient on the computer. And he uh, so he uh, edited those things down. And you were the one that figured out how to add the Instagram handle card thing that we put on there now. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to follow you on Instagram, because you probably put rad photos of you doing stuff on dirt bikes, maybe. No? Everybody's saying no? Nope. He doesn't have any photo. Fo- He's one of those lurkers? I don't even think he does that. He's a, you're a lurker on Instagram? You don't even look at it. No. What do you Okay. What are you kids looking at on Instagram? How do I find, how do I get the kids attracted to the, to the, uh, to the, to the dirt bike tests? What do we got to do? Uh, what? I think probably s- stories. 
stories. Tell oh Instagram stories. Yeah. Do you do Instagram stories? No. Okay, but you look at Instagram stories. Yes. Okay, we need to get my social media mismanager. That's Big John. Um, uh, on this case, because he, he he usually has a pretty good grip. He's going to have to drill down in and figure out what you kids are doing so that we can communicate with you uh, on the on the internets. And I can't find, for some reason, on the Facebooks, I can't find our live feed. Oh, there it is right there. I got it now. Now we're in trouble. Okay, so hold on. Hold on. I got to shut the... Here, that's me talking. Yeah, that's how that's the delay. Good. Got it. It's catching up. I think the internets are kind of slow here for some reason. It's probably because I'm trying to upload the old, <laughs> another episode of this show at the same time. So um, uh, what I wanted to talk about on tonight's show was um, the difference between being cheap or paying for it. You know what that means? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cheap versus paying for it. Actually, hold up that GoPro. So this is a, a GoPro 7. Um I've been shooting a lot of stuff with it, and I used to shoot with what we'll call, uh, call them faux pros. They're those $49 to $70 things, and this is a perfect example of uh, being cheap and buying those and paying for it or paying for it. And uh, this I would pay for if I was actually trying to put quality stuff out, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, uh, what I also want you to do is go see the site. Go see dirtbiketest.com. Um, check out some of the stuff we have up there. New is uh, some of the back episodes of this particular podcast and Trevor's uh, KTM uh, Vegas Torino build, the bike that finished. I think they finished fourth overall in Vegas Torino, if I'm yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Um, fourth and the first team to hit a donkey. They were the first team to hit a donkey. Oh, two, two donkeys or just one? Two donkeys got hit in the race. Oh, two donkeys. They and they, were, they were number one, though. They got the first donkey, right? Was that reported in the local paper here? No, but it was well known in Goldfield. Okay, in Goldfield, they knew about the donkeys. Um, that's because it's that's big news out in Goldfield. Uh, so go check that out. Um, and uh, something else I was gonna gonna mention is everybody's always asking me, "Hey Jimmy, what does it take to be a test rider?" I'll tell you what it what you get to not do. <laughs> you know because. We just got like we get all these kind of cool offers at Dirt Bike Test because everybody wants us to test their stuff and their products. So, how cool would it be? And you can answer this question: How cool would it be to go be a factory rider for Johnny Campbell Racing Team? That would be great. It would be great. So, if a guy could actually like write about how he felt about a bike. Let's say if he was going to get to ride a, a good bike and go be a factory rider on Johnny's team, a guy could go do that if he could write a story about it. That'd be a pretty good deal, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, I'm, I'm pretty much about ready to turn down that offer because I can't go do it because I'm busy and I don't know anybody else who can. So um, that's that writing stuff that we talk about. And then maybe if you talk, if you if you actually, if they put a video camera in front of you and then you talked about your experience, which I know you would struggle with just a little bit. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know, you got to meet my friend Chris Barrett. <laughs> uh, you can go back in the archives. We had a um, we had another, I have another friend of mine who is a co-host on this. And um, Chris Barrett, uh, he did one in the garage with me, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, Chris is really good at saying, yep. That's that's his favorite answer, and when we were back at Dirt Rider, I had to put him on a, um, I had to, I had to put him on in front of the video camera. I'm going to give you this. We need. To, can you go find a pen for uh, Logan over here? Oh, here's a pen right here. Got one right here. I'm going to tell you what you have to do with that in a minute, because he doesn't talk, so we're going to make him write. <laughs> um, uh, Chris said yep a lot, and uh, he's gotten better. Uh, we, we 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 threw a couple beers down his throat, and obviously we can't do that with you. Um, but uh, that uh, helped out. Um, the uh, he, t he talked a little bit more that time. He's actually got re he's a really good test rider. He just has a he, he can sit down and ride it. it. Takes him a long time to sit down and ride it, but he would do it. Um, but anyway, so um, if you think of all the cool stuff that we're um, passing up because we don't have qualified test riders, um, blame yourself. Uh, so uh, another thing we're gonna talk about. I'll hold that up. The Baja Design Squadron Pro headlight. Uh, that we got um, Baja Designs heard me complaining about um, not uh, being able to see, and they sent this thing out here, and uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
And I have, actually, I got a secret little bit of information about Baja Designs, some stuff they got coming out. And we're going to roll right into some of the questions that I got. So let's see where we're at. We got some people in the in the room. Is that with Ron Wilson? Is that Ron Wilson? I think Ron is, I don't know. There was a Ron Wilson at Baja Designs for a long time. Uh, let's see, Victor's out there. Uh, Mark Daniels. Uh, Mark was at our... Rottweiler Performance Live Show. Um, that's good. Uh, and somebody says, hi, Logan, no beer for you. That's a Michelle. <laughs> Someone who I know from a long time ago out in the desert, and she's probably, you probably listen to her. She probably knows better. Um, screen is freezing from time to time. Um, George, I need a technician in here. Uh, let's see. And then we're on to some of the questions. So we will... Uh, get to those as soon as we possibly can, but I'm going to answer the questions that I have uh, right here. Uh, this is from Curtis Kelly. Uh, he says, Jimmy, I ride a WR450F. It's a light dual sport desert single track bike. I run a Maxxis Desert IT and find that they never wear out. You run Maxxis? What kind of tires do you run? Maxxis. Maxxis. Whatever dad puts on it, right? Yeah. Right. So I finally just get bored with them and replace them when they're half worn out. I'm a short shifter, and I find it. I find that I'm very easy on tires. Gummies and hybrids are very popular these days. Rocky Mountain ATV just introduced their own hybrid tire called the Tusk Recon, soft gummy hybrid for single track. What are your thoughts on gummy hybrids? And then he sent me a link to the video, which actually I went and watched because um, I was curious. I've, I've been seeing a lot of chitter-chatter about this. So usually the question is, Jimmy, what do you think about it? Uh, well... I um, I don't like to think too much because it hurts. And when I when I you know what that's like is that yeah. two brain cells only two left. Uh, what do I think about it or, or or what do you know about it? And I when I just have to think about it. Um, if I haven't ridden it or used it, I don't. I I can think about it, but I don't know. So I try to um, kind of separate those two things. For sure. Um, uh, those are popular. The gummy tires are getting um, a lot, a lot uh, less popular. What the? S I got a slow internet. <laughs> I just got a notification that I have a slow internet. So we've we've managed to do that here somehow or another. I don't know exactly how. Oh, because we're streaming two feeds. And you're uploading. And I'm uploading over there. Damn that thing. That's been going for like three hours. I think the internet's around here getting slower. Uh, anyways. Uh, sorry about the freezing. That means we're going to lose 80% of you, but I'm going to tell you what happens. If this happens to freeze, and you can always go back and watch this later because it'll upload the whole video, and or we put these up on YouTube at our convenience or the speed of the internet, which is there. So back to the gummy tires. Um, I have been running them for a long time. I've been, I was one of the first, um, uh, Main, mainstream guys to start talking about the trials tires a long time ago back when they were sort of a I noticed all my real trail riding my guys that were really gnarly trail riding guys uh, were running them in this secret they wouldn't tell anybody <laughs> and so I was I was actually working at a magazine at the time and I started doing it people thought I was kind of an idiot and like why would you do that um, because they worked and it kind of caught on, and we we did actually did a uh, comparison about them. And the thing was, is actually proper trials tires are not very good for dirt bikes because they have very soft sidewalls, and they sometimes don't last very long at all. In other words, the knobs just go flying off because they're never made to go over like 35, 45 miles an hour in reality. Um, and the Rocky Mountain video actually kind of addresses this. They actually do a pretty damn good job of explaining why they developed that tire. Now, it's funny because you look at the post and everybody says it's a copy of the Shinko, uh, what do they call it? It's the it's the tires that Western Power Sport sells. I think it's the Shinko 505, um, which is a tire we've tested on Dirt Bike Test. You can go to the website and read that test. Uh, and it looks a lot like it. And what we found out a lot of times with tires is that it's just like plastic and parts and things. They get knocked off. But on their on Rocky Mountain's video, they actually show a video of a guy sitting in front of a computer with a 3D model and they're claiming design. So 
that's what they're saying. They design it. So I don't know until I actually have one in my hand and I can see where it's manufactured or figure something out. Who knows? Who cares really? Who cares where it's made? It's really how it works. And since I haven't written it, I can't tell you how it works. The concept that they're on is a proper concept. Um, very similar to the Kenda Equilibrium, which in in my world was one of the first uh, specific, like call we'll call it kind of um, uh, trials um, uh, off-road hybrid tires. And that's the one I run. And I have to tell you, like I always tell you, is that Kenda supports my off-road riding schools. And so uh, you're getting a bias uh, on that because I have those on a lot of my bikes. Um, and so uh, those are tires I'm pretty happy with. And then there's there's these tires that are being built for Endurocross. So they originally started out as factory tires where they were just pumping this super gummy rubber into an existing mold. And uh, guys were using them for enduro cross, and they were like cheater tires. And then Golden Tire really started um, selling and pushing those. So there's a lot of different options out there, uh, and a lot of different price points. So you can kind of uh, kind of uh, choose based on that. But uh, Curtis, I think that if you're easy on tires, and the, and people always ask about like, should I use a Trials tire? Should I use those? As the knobs get start getting closer together and the blocks get tighter, the more that your riding style means that you spin or skid your rear wheel, the more you need to stay away from those closer block tires because they essentially hydroplane or on the dirt. You know they 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 don't reach in and gri- gra- uh, you know bite the you don't have the enough spacing between the square edges um, to reach in and grab. And when that tire starts spinning it looks like a slick to the ground. Um, and that's why you have the bigger spaces in the, in the knobs. So if it kind of sounds like you're, you know, short shift or all that stuff, you're really going to like and benefit from these tires. And I totally agree with you, Maxxis ITs. I have some on a few set of wheels that I, on bikes that I bought that were on there and they just won't wear out and they're still not wearing out. You get a lot of life out of yours. Yeah. You sure? Very you got a lot of, you get a lot of life out of them. Yeah, pretty mm. close to almost three races. Oh, good job! Ton of rides. That was perfect. You did that. You did that absolutely perfect. <laughs> he 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 went through the he went through the entire uh, dialogue there while I had my sip of my almost near empty beer. So you're not gonna have to do that much more because it'll be gone in a second. So, um, but uh, you know, try you know try. Uh, try that tire try that i think the th- three tires in that range that i'm very familiar with are the uh uh the new one from rocky mountain mc there's the shinko 505 and there's two different sizes and you'll have to check the story because one of them worked way better than the other one uh, the good thing was is those were available in 19s and i know the kenda equilibrium i don't know if that's available in 19 yet but the advantage the kenda has is it's dot approved and i've run it at 80 and 90 miles an hour and i've never lost a knob off of the center of a Kenda Equilibrium. So I think we might even have a test of that tire up on the website. So that's what the website's for. Go check it. Check my facts and get back to me and tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about or I'm only 70% right 100% of the time. Uh, Okay, next question. Hi, Jimmy. I hope you'll be interested. Consider my submission for publishing motorbike-related content on dirtbikedesk.com. Martin Varand, a motocross six times Estonian champion, asked me to assist in the publication process. Martin manages motocrossadvice.com. Uh, George, fact checker George, can you go and um, uh, check out motocrossadvice.com for me real quick? I want to see what this guy's got on. I didn't have a chance to preview this, as you can tell. Um, Let's see. He's got a lot of experience. Uh, his experience is amazing. Needless to say, he pays attention to the details when we discuss topics and ideas based on his huge experience in motocross. How to ride safely. Do you ride safely when you're riding motocross? I try to. Good. Okay. How to avoid common mistakes when buy equipment. No, I, I didn't mispronounce that. When buy equipment. I, I didn't know they spoke Chinese in Estonia. Um Always share a lot of stories from motocross comp- competitions. We are ready to create content based on your guidelines. Please review and post samples. Um, Alex, can you come to the? Can you send? Can you send uh, 
what's uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, can you send can you send uh, uh, a six time Estonian champion Martin uh, to me in in Nevada so I can send him to be a factory rider for Johnny Campbell at a Honda intro? Uh, just get back to me on that. We'd appreciate it. Oh wait a minute. Uh, reach out to me at buymotorcycletours.com news mistakes. What? <laughs> oh, it's a marketing video. You know how you get those ones from um, Nigeria, mm-hmm. where they where they're gonna they're gonna <laughs> take care of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Um, let's see. If you are glad to discuss the publication, would be so kind as to let me know at your earliest convenience. <laughs> yeah, we get all kinds of stuff here. Um, Greg Yoder uh, asks, Jimmy, you said the hoses on Johnny Campbell's CRF450 race bike are double wrapped. What what are they double wrapped with? A second radiator hose. So basically they take another radiator hose and slit it down the back and spread it open and pop it over the top of the first radiator hose to add a second layer of protection, mostly from pokey pokey little pointy things like cactus needles that could go in there. Um, uh, and it's done on the front, then the front, more front directional side, and it protects, you know, the the, the bike if it were to, uh, uh, you know, run through cactus and stuff. That was done at the uh, Mint 400 race. Uh, so I didn't, I'm surprised I didn't put a photo of that up there, but um, you can look closely at the engine detail and probably see it. Uh, that'll help. Um, who asked this question? What is rally navigation? How hard is it just to follow a GPS? I do it all the time in my car. (laughs) Grab that paper right over there. Grab that paper right there. Okay. So rally navigation is not, uh, yeah, get it, get it kind of closer up there for a second. Yeah. Like that. So that, that's a road book. That's not a GPS. It's printed on paper. That's what they navigate with during rallies it's not a gps they have a device that acts like a gps that does some stuff i can pull that back down but when you look at that when you look at that and what it is it's a series of blocks with a mileage a picture of what's on the ground and then some information and you're trying to do that or or read that and do what it says at at speed on a motorcycle or you're sitting next to a co-driver in a car that's reading that information off to you that's what um, rally navigation is, and it is not just following the GPS. So GPS basically tells the organization whether you were on the course like you're supposed to, and it also tells them uh, if you are quiet, quiet over there. <laughs> yeah. Um, it also tells them every once in a while the navigation is really tricky, and they will use a um, they will use the GPS to guide you into a place when it's too difficult to do with a, with a map book. So uh, Kermit asks, why didn't KTM ever build a 690 adventure? Inquiring minds want to know. Um, so earlier today I asked uh, for, um, on, our, uh, on our Facebook page, I asked for some questions and we're going to start going down the line of these questions and you're going to realize how ridiculous they get. And I'm going to keep answering the questions that you guys asked in order to stop this ridiculousness, because now you're going to have to put up with me uh, answering ridiculous questions. And since the Internet's slow, I don't care right now because <laughs> we're, 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 losing, we're losing stuff as, as it goes. I wish I could run over there and shut that other computer off, but I'm afraid I'll lose five hours of uh, uploading time. Uh, so let's see. Why didn't KTM ever build a, K, uh, a 690 adventure? I think that they thought like I did that it's a horrible motorcycle and they didn't want to invest any more um, uh, development in it. That's that's my answer. <laughs> I, I'm not a fan of that bike. Um, it's not one of, not one of my favorites. You see how many we get in our schools, yeah? Yeah. That's a it's a popular it's a popular bike. Um, but it, it 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 I don't know. I think there's a there's a there's a market for single cylinder kind of like more road going bikes in in. It it kind of it's built on the trellis chassis that's kind of like the rally bikes and it's kind of they could kind of do it but I don't know um, they're still making it uh, they sell a lot of them 
Um, there's a lot of kits out there for people to convert the bike into a rally bike, but they're a little complex. Um, I don't know. Maybe KTM decided they want to make a bike that they'd let the aftermarket um, take over. So uh, let's see. Brock Suter asks, can you ride a motorcycle at Burning Man? Um, I don't know if he's asking me specifically if I can or if you can. I don't think you can have too many motorized uh, vehicles out there. Maybe you can ride an art motorcycle at Burning Man. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a that's a that's a good question though. I haven't been to Burning Man. It's going on right now. Uh, sorry, I can't be there. I probably belong there. I don't know. Uh, Pat Shooty asks, and Pat, for those that don't know, was the guy who would not give me press passes at the Supercrosses back in the two uh, thousands. I was I was a certified regular real journalist, and and back when Supercross was getting popular, Pat wouldn't give me. Um, Press passes uh, for some reason, probably because I said something bad about Supercross or I wouldn't put Supercross on the cover of my magazine every month. But uh, anyways, Pat and Pat put on some of the best crossover events ever. So those two things. Pat Shooty, is motorcycle related hyphenated? And he hyphenated it when he asked me that. And as an editor of a motorcycle magazine, I'm going to have to say that I don't know. Um, but since you hyphenated it, I suspect that motorcycle related is Hyphenated. I'm going to throw that out to the crowd here, where there's one person that's a copy editor, and he's Mojave Bob is looking completely confused. So, Pat, that really is not a very good question. I think we've just lost 16 viewers since I asked that question, so I'm blaming you, and you cannot have a press pass to come and uh, watch Tech Talk Taco Tuesday, but put on more crossover events. Scott Cox says, describe your preferred drink from outer space. This is an inside joke. Uh, my preferred drink from outer space is really simpler. You got to close your plug your ears right now. Got it. It's um, you go to this bar down in Vegas, and it's called Ass Juice, and it's I think it's whatever falls off the the when they're spilling the drinks into that tray, and they pour it in there. That's from outer space. Speaking of outer space, if you want to go, um, uh, what are, what are they doing out in uh, Area Fifty One here pretty soon? Storm Area Fifty One. Yeah. You doing that? No. Yeah, they're serving drinks from outer space out there too. So uh, just don't come through Pahrump on your way there. We don't want you here. Uh, let's see. David Lieberg asks, why does it hurt when I pee? Why are you asking this on a motorcycle podcast? But since you brought it up, um, are you talking? I, I suspect you're talking about like when you're trying to pee while you're riding, right? Is that That's what he's talking about. Probably. So he's doing a long distance race and he's going to pee himself because he doesn't want to stop. Well, in my world, I always stopped and took the pee because in Johnny Campbell's world, and I raced with Johnny Campbell, and he can pee his pants. I just I just said that out loud. Johnny pees his pants. So now I'm in trouble. Um, and David, it's all your fault. You shouldn't have asked those kind of questions. So I tried it once and it made my, my boots and gear stink so bad that... Um, and it took, I had to slow down so much. I mean, I just can't relax. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. So uh, I guess that's what you're asking. Oh, Mitch, who is here, by the way, Mitch says, do you feel the Honda Trail 90 will make a comeback and become the bike of choice for true Dakar racers? Well, and he put some sort of little emoji thing that my computer can't print. Is that a stupid question, Logan? Uh, maybe. Maybe. Well, he's right there. You can say it in front of him because I am. That's a stupid question, Mitch. That's that's you're you're feeding the fire here. It, we're trying we're trying like we're trying to make this a serious podcast where people learn stuff. And like the Honda Trail ninety, I didn't even like those. I, I hated those more than KTM six nineties. Okay, even though I had the ninety on the back, and everybody's all about numbers these days. No, no, the answer is no. Kelly Anson. So Kelly is Trail Tech's. Uh, marketing guy, which means he gets to go, he go, he gets to go riding and take pictures for Instagram. That's probably almost as good as being a, a magazine editor for Cycle World magazine back in the day before the internet ruined the job where you got only had to produce one page of content a month. And I had that job. So, um, so Kelly gets to go, uh, does all their social media marketing and, uh, helps me out when I have problems with, uh, things and hooks me up with the, uh, Trail Tech Voyager Pro, which is 
especially if you're riding with other guys with Trail Tech Voyager Pros, the best GPS out there. And the reason it has buddy tracking, so you can see where your buddies are on the GPS, so you don't have to stop and wait for them. This, that's a plug for the Voyager Pro. Yes, that's a good, that's a good GPS unit, and that's why it's better than some of the other ones that are more popular, Garmin's and etc. The like, uh, I do like the Trail Tech. So Kelly asks, oh. You want to read that? Why don't you read that out loud? Because I'm going to have to have some. I'm going to have to do something. Where's the best trail? Uh, low tide over here uh, in the fridge. <laughs> no, the best, oh. the best trail is to the fridge right now and pick up another one of these, um, the high lives. Yeah. Uh, where is the best trail? And, uh, <coughs> <laughs> oh, and what oil is the best? Those are Kelly's two questions. So he knows me well. Um, I don't ever tell you where the best trail is. That's uh, that's one of my things. Uh, so he's 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 making he's he's making that. And what is the best oil? These are questions that just cannot be answered. They're impossible to answer those questions. So uh, uh, good. Uh, is that a good answer? Yeah, probably. Probably okay. Because you don't want to tell everybody where you're riding, especially when you're talking to everybody. Because then everybody goes riding there, and the best trail is no longer the best trail. Thank you, Chivo. Good job. Uh, cheers. Um, oh, and everybody wants to know what tequila we're drinking tonight? Not you, just me. Um, I haven't had any yet, but I'm going to have some of the uh, Regosa. You want to know why? Because it was sitting on the table. <laughs> That's always a good reason for that. I didn't spill this on the computer. Okay. Um, Charlie Williams. Oh, jeez. Here we go. Um, here, why don't you... Why don't you uh, why don't you answer read those questions for me? But let me tell a quick Charlie Williams story. So Charlie Williams uh, used to write a column for Trail Rider magazine. And speaking of Trail Rider magazine, I did get uh, uh, an email from Paul Clipper the other day, who is writing more books about the ISDE. So if you're interested in ISDE and ISD D, ISDE ISDT history. Um, look on Amazon, search for uh, Paul Clipper, and he tell he's a teller of tall tales that are generally uh, true, good, good, uh, good stories. Uh, go look at his books because he's trying to uh, he wants to do more of them, and I think if we give him a kick in the ass, he will. So Charlie Williams, and I don't know how this happened. Paul let him write a column for his uh, then magazine, and uh, Charlie tells some interesting stories. And Charlie used to have a column that was hard to read. I think I think between Charlie and Jerry Bernardo, um, you got your own Hunter S. Thompson esque. Like I'm not sure where we're going with this whole story. I don't know why they're in motorcycle magazine. Charlie wrote one of the best pieces of moto journalism I've ever read, and it was called Tattoo. And you need to you need to go read it because it's about it's about bull tacos, and that's I'm just going to leave it right there. Very, very um, interesting story, and I every time I think about it, I still, it, I still laugh. So, what is Charlie's question? He says, "How do you get Teflon to stick to the pan?" How do you get Teflon to stick to the pan? Because everybody knows Teflon is a non-stick substance. It's made to make things slippery, so you can cook your eggs on your pan. And we have to figure out. We have to take this in the motorcycle context. I'm not really sure. Uh, how that works, but Bob, how do you get Teflon to stick to the pan? Make the pan really hot. Okay, so you make the pan really hot. So Charlie, uh, the pan. Where's the pan in the motor? The skid pan. Skid pan. Think of lining cylinders. Lining like cylinders. Like well, I've actually had I've actually had piston pin yeah. plugs made of Teflon. Yeah, so um, so if you get your cylinder really hot, you can get those to stick to the side of your cylinder. So run it at 110 percent, and everybody knows you can't run something at 110 percent. But um, run it at 110 percent. And I notice he has a second question there. So when the melt snow, when the snow melts, where does the white go? When the snow melts, where does the white go? Politically, <laughs> well, good answer. Uh Politically, <laughs> not a good answer. I, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna I for, for my uh, my advisor told me I'm not supposed to answer that question, Charlie. So you're gonna have to um, Google it because Google will give you the answer uh, as good as I can on that. Uh, 
And then, and then I have a, something called an anniversary follower. This is new to me. I was, I was trying to keep up on the Facebooks these days, and now we have anniversary followers. So I don't know what exactly that means. Um, so uh, we'll try our best. <laughs> uh, adventure question. Thank God we're back on motorcycles. Is there a wor- way to turn traction control completely off on a 2012 BMW GS? I don't know. I, 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 well, this is what I'm going. There, I'm, I guarantee you that there's a way that that you can default the system, whether it's through it's through some pushing buttons. And generally, in my experience, BMW likes to have you push two buttons at the same time or do something that takes two hands, which means that in their world you've come to a complete stop. But trust me, I've been able to do it without coming to a complete stop. Um, hold two buttons a certain amount of time to verify that you really wanted that system to be disabled. If you can't figure out that, I would consult the owner's manual. And then if you still can't figure it out, um, and you didn't learn about this here, um, you can disable one of the wheel sensors. And then you, generally all the traction control features uh, go out the window. So a lot of times I actually had an inline switch on some of my more difficult to disable bikes that would just eliminate the signal coming from the rear wheel sensor. It would send all the stuff into faults and then I could skid and get the wheel to spin like I wanted to. So hopefully that answers your question. I've seen some people pull the fuse, but be aware when you do some of these things, especially the more technological advanced vehicles, you are in for a trip to the dealer because the light's gonna flash and tell you your bike's broken. So uh, yeah, hopefully that helps you out there. Um, Steve, also another anniversary follower, $64 million question. How did you get that number? Anybody? Crickets? Did Alter 4 Sports contact you to set the course for setup King of the Motos? No. No, they have, they have all my old courses. I mean, we, they're all, they, they have all the GPS files. They did not contact me to set up the course, um, for the King of the Motos. Uh, Eric. Hermstead says, your thoughts on two-way radios, Bluetooth, Cenotype, UHF, VHF, rugged radios, etc." Well, I want to tell you that um, I'm not a big radio fan uh, just because sometimes it seems like you start getting complacent and you start relying on it and then it doesn't work. You know, you're warning somebody about something and they expect it to work and it doesn't work. Uh, that is not a good thing. Um, but I've run them before. I've just usually run... The ones that we used to run in Baja were, and you can get them at PCI Race Radios, has a really good setup that's probably the best, most consistent um, that I've used. Uh, I don't remember whether it's UHF or VHF. I'm not really sure, but uh, it's all kind of line of sight. And so my thoughts are, um, you know, I like I like the solitude of riding as well. So the radios kind of kind of toss that out the window as well. So um, I've used them before. I've, I've had music playing in my headset and all this stuff, and I'm not I'm not an expert at that, so I'm going to kind of hold back on that. Matt Stoutenberg, can you really fix a water leak with cactus milk, bazooka bubble gum, and dental floss? <laughs> um, yes, you can. You, you can just keep trying. Is what I and if you if you can't do it right now, uh, keep trying. And San Felipe Bob asks, San Felipe Bob, who is a anniversary follower, which is, it's a, these are the top fans. They've up- upgraded. Have you ever been in a Turkish prison? No, I have not been in a Turkish prison. Uh, let's see. And then San Felipe asks, what was your worst crash? Don't like to talk about it, but it was probably the one that ended my riding career at this certain spot in uh, Morocco on the last Dakar I ever rode. So, yeah, thanks, Bob, for bringing that up. Now I'm totally bummed out, and I'm not going to be able to answer Mitch's question, which he asks, are you in the top-secret DBT lab tonight? Because he wanted to come and hang out. And I guess we answered that. So those are our questions, questions of the week. How do you think we did answering them? Uh, Throw some thumbs-ups across the screen. Um, Now that we've completely killed... The uh, <laughs> the stuff with that segment. What? Oh, we have a question our, our from the. Friend George is uh, commenting on the quality. Of the our- quality of the feed is horrible tonight. Yeah, I'm I'm aware of that. Uh, I'm sorry too. I'm gonna reload. It actually shows that I'm live, but I can't. I can't. Same thing. I can't even see it over here. Uh, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna 
I'm going to really wreck the internets now. I'm going to try to see what happens if I go to YouTube and see if I can see our feed and see if there's questions over there. It's not happy. We've got to figure this stuff out before we start doing this. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to reload this. I'm going to go back to the questions. And let's see. What is... See, this is what a good co-host would do. So next time you can practice this, you would have the questions there, and then you would ask me. And then that way you would actually be talking. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're all choked up. Yeah, keep talking real quick. I'm busy. I'm bummed out about our ratings right now. Where's that bottle in front of you? The <clears throat> tech, tech Oh, there we go. You remembered, see? So we're going to talk about stuff that, we, that we've been testing. So remember what I had you guys do. Put some of that stuff in all the bikes before we put them away for the summer, yeah? Yeah. And so how many ounces did you put in a gallon? You don't remember? No. Okay. You can read the label. Um, so this is the Chevron Tecron um, Power Sports and Small Engine Fuel System Treatment. And the reason we're talking about it is because they sent some out for us to kind of test, and we put them in all of our bikes that we put away for mo majority of the summer, and we pulled them out yesterday and started all the bikes up. And generally, the bikes do not start. At least a quarter of them just don't start. Plug Pilot Jets. These are carbureted bikes. Um, a couple of them are fuel-injected because they've been sitting in hot containers, and they're not doing too good. They all started with the exception of one, and the reason the one didn't start was... Guess it. Why didn't it start? Bad battery. Exactly. Bad battery. But they all started, and, and they started and idled idled down pretty quick. And at this at this temperature, at 105, whatever it was yesterday, you don't have to use the choke too much. They start. They kind of start right up. You know, pump if they have a squirt, bang, started right up. They, they were a little kind of clumsy if you pumped. You know, if you if they had a pumper and you kind of pumped it, because that, that's where the worst of the gas manages to leak down into. Um but overall, I'm giving this stuff a thumbs up uh, because that was kind of a rarity, and uh, so pretty pretty impressed. And this is this is meant, and I had all the the terminology and words for what they call it a, a, a constant use product. They want it. They say you can keep it in the gas all the time. It stabilizes the fuel, keeps the water out. We don't have a water problem too much, um, but uh, pretty pretty good. So if you are storing bikes or putting them away. Uh, I would put this stuff in, and I'm going to continue to put it in our bikes because I've tried other stuff like running two-stroke oil into the gas, even on the four-strokes, you know, keeping some mix in there because um, that helps coat, kind of coat the carburetors, and this stuff uh, outperformed that and didn't gum up uh, any of the stuff that, as far as I could tell. So pretty good on that. Grab the Baja Designs headlight. So our, our next... Um, our next dealie, Bob, here. Uh, this is a Baja Design Squadron Pro headlight. It retails for about $264, which may seem like a lot. It is a lot. But for the light that this little sucker puts out that bolts into your most of this, the bikes that have um, uh, the right kind of headlight shells, they kind of screw right in. Um, doesn't take much in the way of... Uh, you know, they have a little tab in there, and it kind of bolts in there, and then you angle it and adjust it. You can keep holding that up, or I'm going to have you hold my beer. Um, so uh, that light, um, I was blown away by how good it is. I've used those before. We also have a test on an older version up on Dirt Bike Test, and they're pretty stinking good. Okay, George, that's your key. Set that, set that uh, if, you can, if you're still connected. Um, Put that uh, the link up there that I sent you on the thing. We, hey, we haven't had to apologize to anybody just yet, have I? Yeah, maybe Mark, Pat Shooty. Yeah, <laughs> um, that was good light because I've been riding around with stock headlights, and so Baja Designs heard me complain about that, and they said, "Hey, we've got something." And the cool thing about this is it's plug and play. And by plug and play, it took about ten minutes to bolt into the frame, and then they send this little adapter. That goes from that connects from their switch to your switch. It runs off the AC power on the bike, so it goes straight off the the um, ignition. And there's plenty of power to run it. Uh, the only problem is, and this is Honda's problem, is that when that bike shuts off, the light shuts off. It does not stay on 
kind of like the odometer, which is also something that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. When the bike shuts off, everything powers down right away. There's no, it doesn't hold on for a few minutes because it's not running off of the uh, DC side of the ignition. So uh, this thing was super good. Uh, it, and, and here's, and we're going to get back to that cheap versus paying for it. You know, when you get something cheap or should you pay for it? The reason the $264 is good is you could buy probably an LED light that claims that it has 4,900 lumens. That is what this one claims. Uh, that is probably not 12 ounces, which is the weight on this one. It probably doesn't bolt into your stock headlight shell. You're going to get it from who knows where. It might put out that amount of light, but I guarantee you it's not going to be focused and pointed and do a proper spread. And this is what Baja Designs does and has always done is they're very particular about how they aim and spread out their light and, and throw it on the ground. Um, not up in the air, not into the dust, into that stuff. So uh, this puts out a super nice spread and a pattern. Um, this one is is kind of a – it doesn't have any um, – on this particular light, as you see, that's it's kind of a clear, it's kind of a clear shield. On some of the other ones, they have feathered, they have feathered lenses that are more of a of a of a flood. This one's more of a pencil, but it's not a pencil in that it 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 does have a nice, uh, really good active uh, stream of light. And I was never, as long as the bike was running, never looking for uh, more light. So pretty happy with that thing. And so when you get cheap ones, uh, you know, it might just be a, a tube of light. And if you've ever tried to follow like a spot or something like that, or the thing that makes this one thing that makes this good is that since it is focused, right, it throws it plenty far where I wasn't able to outrun the headlight. And then it wasn't just a pencil beam trying to throw that it was spreading it out. So I had enough to do turning. I could see what was off to the side, you know, so I didn't run into a donkey um, and stuff like that. So I had a really good uh, um, ride last night. Uh, and the last time I used it, super happy. Uh, if you're looking for lights, check out Baja Designs. And the other thing is they told me is they have um, a light that's going to come in almost this size that puts out. Let's see. Wait a minute. That's how it. Uh, that, that, uh, it's it's a it's basically a, for a helmet light. It's going to put out 2,300 lumens. Uh, in a single reflector. So out of one of the, out of one of the little teeny tiny guys. So, uh, and pretty soon it's going to be a laser. <laughs> I mean, they're going to have, they're going to have laser ones. So, uh, coming out, I think you can see it at the sand sport show. Some of their new lights that they've got coming out. Um, you didn't hear it here. I just found that out. Um, pretty cool stuff. So good. And then, and then grab that GoPro. So yeah, next thing I've been using a lot lately, if you watch the KTM videos, all the videos that were shot with, with his GoPro 7, it's super easy to use. I haven't even started using half the features. I should probably start streaming this podcast with this thing because it's probably better than the camera that we're using right now that keeps giving us bad internet feeds. <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, if you watch the KTM videos, there's a lot of cool riding in there and they're all filmed with with that thing. So I'm going to run into the questions that we have on the thing now that we on the on the forum. Um, Mark said he watched our recluse review video. He said it was very informative. Uh, that's good. George is putting the um, tests up on our on from our site. That's even better. Is the eight BES left-handed thread or right-handed thread, Tarek? You can't. That's why you worked at Suzuki. Um, I can't seem to get it tight. <laughs> You're working on a Suzuki and it's stripped out. That's what's wrong. Um, let's see. Eduardo Ross. Hi, Jimmy. How do you think the recluse on the new 19 Honda CRFX 450? It's awesome. I know because we have one and we had it in there. And unfortunately, I took it out because I wanted to see if we're kind of check. We're trying to trace down why the bike, the clutch isn't the best. And so I took it back out. But uh, the Recluse Radius CX is worth the money to get it if you want it. And even if you just go with the replacement plates, every step of the way, and I think we talk about it in our long-term uh, update uh, on that bike, uh, We can you can find all the information there. Um, stop the download. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next time I won't be down. It, I, 
don't want to waste four or five hours of uploading. Uh, let's see. Uh, plenty of advice and opinions for free, of course. Um, let's see. Carol, you know, you know Carol Dunkerson? Yeah. Yeah, she says, uh, how cool is this? Very. Yeah. Okay, if you say more things, you get to come back next time, and then we're going to fire Big John. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you're ready to speak up now? Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, free, three words and it freezes. Yeah, of course. Uh, let's see. It needs tequila, and so do I, as a matter of fact. So um, tequila and taco juice on the hard drive. Um, good. San Felipe Bob joined in. And and then I'm sure it's going to go downhill from here. <laughs> right? Where are we at? 751? we got to blow nine more minutes of this on this podcast here. Tell a um, rally story. <laughs> tell a life story? No, tell a rally story. A rally story. Revolves around the photo that you put up. Oh, okay. Tell a rally story. Hold on. Okay, third strike and you're out, man. <laughs> you got you got to you got to fill those voids. That's the job of the co-host, remember? Okay, you can go you you practice next week. Um Let's see, uh, the story, that story, actually, that was one of the best days of my life, that picture. Um, I don't know why I came across it today. I was fumbling through some stuff. And so the story on the Facebook feed was a picture of me sitting with my legs crossed on the 1997 Paris to Dakar rally. I was sitting underneath the wing of a Safair airplane in Timbuktu, Timbuktu, Niger, Right? Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's where that's where it's at. And um, so I was the fastest guy to Timbuktu. <laughs> you know, and they say, "Go, you know, where's Timbuktu? Get lost. Go to Timbuktu. Whatever." Um, I was the fastest guy there, and it was on the '97 Dakar. It was the like three quarters of the way through the rally. They said it was the stage that would. Um, they said it was the stage that would separate the men from the boys. And uh, luckily, um, some of the men had already kind of secured their positions on the rally, like Peter Hansel and stuff, and they weren't necessarily pinning it. And uh, um, it was the first stage win I ever had on that rally. But it was it was really long and fast in the beginning. Fast, fast, big, what we call chops, <coughs> wide open. Bless you. Um, you. Wide open uh, segments and and. And the twin cylinders would just disappear out in the distance. And I was riding a KTM uh, 640 that year. And uh, not a factory one either. It was just a, a standard um, customer production bike. And they would just disappear. And then and then we'd get in some camel grass and some more technical stuff. And I'd catch back up to them. And three or four times we went back and forth. And um, finally we were riding this really bad camel grass. And camel grass is like small sand dunes with bowling balls in it. That's the only way to describe uh, it's just got grass coming out, and any place is a clump of grass. It's like hitting a bowling ball, and and because uh, I was a desert racer and on a smaller bike, I could kind of pin it through that stuff compared to the twin cylinder bikes back then. And uh, so I just would kind of go go blowing right by him, and I could just see him just going uh, American, you know, just he's going to cartwheel and crash. So I uh, took off, and the navigation was really tough. Uh, it was it was all off piste, you know, no no um, no tracks. You were basically going from kind of well to well, uh, kind of where the animals and people may walk. So it wasn't really roads or anything. And uh, you know, after a while, I kept looking back, and I didn't see anybody. And but I, my navigation was spot on. I felt really good, and. I literally got to the finish and they weren't even set up. They were not expecting anybody to be there that quick. I mean, I, I kind of pushed the pace a little bit. and uh, uh, But I got to the finish and since they were, like I said, just getting set up, none of the media and everybody was there. I just got my card stamped and then rode the few miles back into town where Timbuktu was. And uh, that's that's that picture is me sitting underneath the airplane wing uh doing uh, an interview with uh, with journalists. And after the hardest day in the Dakar, I was feeling pretty good and actually in pretty good shape and relaxed. So uh, if you want to see that photo, you can go to Dirt Bike Test on Facebook, and it's the photo about today's horrible podcast that you are having to suffer through. So, um, yeah, hopefully if you're back, I think we're down to one person. <laughs> everybody dropped everybody at this point. 
the YouTubes are holding pretty strong at seven. <laughs> so um, I can't I can't really see. I'm going to close this one down right here. I'm going to see if I can get on the YouTube and um, and see if I can uh, see if there's any questions or comments over on that on that side of the thing. I know they can chime in with with comments as we have another couple minutes possibly to blow here. Let's see. Does it tell me if I'm live? My channel. How about a notification? Does it tell me I'm live in my... Uh, good. We've made people sadly confused. Oh, no. That was on... <laughs> uh, I, I was talking about XC, and I started saying XCW. Uh, yeah. And I'm the Jimmy Lewis who used to race MX ages ago. Yes, I'm that same guy. Uh where is the how do you how do you think we find the live feed on this? Mm. Do you know how this thing works? Not really. Not really. <laughs> Wait, we're live right now. Here it is right here. I found it. See there's us. Okay. Um got a couple questions. XC three hundred low end torque is a ten on the scale of one to twenty high torque. Where does a three fifty, four fifty, and five hundred XC fit on the scale? 300 XC, a low end torque is a 10 on a scale of 1 to 20. When, when do we start using the 1 to 20 scale? Um, <laughs> 5? 5 on a scale of 1 to... I'm not sure. <laughs> hey, Brad. <laughs> I, I, your scales are a little bit different than our scales. Maybe you're from um, the same place Charlie Williams is from. Uh, let's... trying to get your information so can help you. Oh, you're trying to, yeah, get my information. Um, or that place. Uh, so 350, 450, everyone, just like you would think, every one of them kind of pulls up. But, man, I tell you what, it, and here's what I was learning last night because I was riding the Honda 450X, which, you know, has really good torque. And and the last bike I rode around this similar loop was the KTM 300 XCW. Man, is that KTM fast. And it does not sound like it. It does not make go-fast noises. It just pulls you very fast, and that's torque. Um but the same the same thing the 350 does not have it does not have the torque of the Honda 450X and and so when you roll it on it just doesn't tug you it it kind of goes and it really wants to have rpm to make you go so if you want to go as fast as you would on the other bike and this is all traction dependent you're going to have to rev it up and and run it a little bit harder so uh yeah um, the numbers kind of speak for itself, but the more you like to rev, the smaller bike. But remember, 300 in my world, a 300 two-stroke is like a 600 cc four-stroke. Remember, it's firing twice as much. You know, so you're getting 300 cc's every bang. Where on a 600 cc four-stroke, you're getting 300 cc's every other, you know, every rotation. So that's that's just the way it works. Um, have you ridden any betas? If so, what do you think compared to KTMs? Uh, they're different. Um, are they better? Um, probably not as refined. KTM seems to be one or two steps ahead all the time technologically, but beta is a long running company that doesn't make changes very quick. And when they do, they are, they seem to be pretty proven. You ridden a beta? No. No. Why? You're too young? Yeah, a trials, trials bike. bike. What do you want to ride next? Don't say my Husaberg 570. Dude, that's <laughs> the best bike ever. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I'll have you fooled pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Brad says, what is the uh, best oil? <laughs> Fresh oil. It's, that's right. Hey, Brad, I like you, man. That's a, that's, a, that's a good question. So glad we could get over to the YouTubes and answer some of the questions. We are going to work on some of our technological difficulties. Um, blame uh, Logan here, who's supposed to be our uh, engineer. You're supposed to fix all these problems. Uh, we'll have him over here running the wires or cables or whatever you need to do to fix this stuff as soon as possible. I'd like to thank everybody for joining in. Uh, this is Jimmy Lewis with a dirt bike test. I've got Logan sitting next to me. How, is it pretty amazing that I've remembered your name this entire podcast? Yeah. I call you Tommy yet? No? Not not in this podcast. Not? Not? Yeah. Okay. Is there another podcast we don't know about? Yeah. No. Well, yeah. It, it's I can never remember his name when he first started working for me, so I just kept making it up. Yep. So, 
Uh, thanks for joining in. We will see you uh, next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. West Coast time. Otherwise, you're probably watching this on one of our feeds. If you are, subscribe to us, like us. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Google dirtbiketest.com and you'll see all your answers. Yeah, Google whatever you want to know about and dirtbiketest.com. So if you need to know why the snow is clear when it turns into water, just add dirtbiketest.com to the end of it and you'll have your answers. So with that, for Logan, this is Jimmy. We will see you out on the trail. Cheers.